Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. When life changes you. When life changes you. And so how does this change occur? Where does it occur? Where is it rece received? What is it received by? <clears throat> Sometimes we are so much more than an object. We're like an object dreaming it's a subject, realizing it is always awake. Honestly, guys, <laughs> when I come to give these talks, there's different um, there's different avenues I tend to take it. It's it's I'm telling you, communication is really like flight. One can say a lot of human suffering. doesn't exist. A huge percentage of human suffering <clears throat> has not, uh, doesn't have to do with the actual event. Sorry guys, just a second. This um Okay. Sorry guys, I'm, I'm listening to music in the background. But I have headphones on. Pretty much, what can I say? Life is changing all the time. I, in my childhood, I felt it was static. I came to see it as dynamic beyond my comprehension. Then, in some sense, the strength of the unknown overpowered my knowledge. <clears throat> I felt a sort of universal sort of loneliness. Not that I felt lonely in the universe, I felt a universal solitude. You know, being lonely is a choice, guys. I'm telling you, being most people who feel lonely, it's a choice. <clears throat> but you can also say a warrior running in battle is also lonely. So, so you see, it, it's, um, but that warrior actually had is doesn't feel lonely in that moment. <clears throat> Anyways, I reached a point where I realized the path I was going was heavy. And something that really I kind of have felt throughout the years, my intuition communicating to me, has been in, in, in exactly that, suddenly something feeling heavy, as if a decision feeling heavy. That That has been... I could say that is a sign I have felt uh, of my inner realm. Sometimes it's strange, you know, sometimes it's like I've, 
I've come to do something physically, okay? Now, <clears throat> the person sees outside in the outer realms the morality of the object. Don't do it, do it. But you can't really see the morality of subjects, you know? <clears throat> you can have subjective evocations. That means I've, like, just like how, imagine somebody kicks a soccer ball and it hits you. <laughs> There are moments where the unknown enters our life and the knowledge can never be the same and that's what I mean by when life changes you. It is literally the moment where you realize you were never the same archetype. You never are. I mean, sometimes <clears throat> I could kind of see why Darwin spoke about adaption and evolution in regards to them being gradual, a gradual change over time. And I don't know, it's kind of like I've been waking up every day feeling like the same person only to look in the mirror and see the physical phenomena is not the same. The subjectivity is not the same. It's kind of like human consciousness is just memory. It's kind of strange. <clears throat> it's like how can you even have imagination if, it's, if there isn't some sort of memory? So on some level... <clears throat> you can see it as being these kind of sort of cause and effect uh, probabilistic kind of reality. So it's pretty much like this. Either we're looking at things with a certain determination, with a certain presumption of context, or things are random. Pretty much chaos and order is pretty much what human beings have been speaking about, you know? <clears throat> And what's fascinating is someone can say a sentence and it can appear chaotic to someone and it can appear ordered to someone. You see, there needs to be a certain roughness preserved with human life. It took me a while to understand this. That it's, all, it's important in life to be, of course, elegant, to be, to aim for the higher <clears throat> to aim for <clears throat> the, um, the positions, the experiences of a lifetime. But at the same time, it's like after a certain point, you stop moving where you don't see any progress. And in my life, it has simply been this. I've just walked a certain direction. And it's not that I've become like instantly I've changed away. It's as if like... There was a story that I instantly committed to memory. It was a Vedic story because I felt a strange <clears throat> association with this story. It's the story of one of the, I forget the guy's name, but he's a famous sage of India. He was one of the famous sages of India where his poetry, <clears throat> his poetry is in the books of most people's households. I'm not Indian, but I, I've heard this. The story is that this parent, these parents, they have a very slow kid. <clears throat> and they see this enlightened guy who's saying, like, who's liberating people. And they're like, all right, come on, man. Uh, here, we'll let you enlighten our kid. You know? <clears throat> and the man, the guru, listens to the moment. So he's honestly trying to snap this cat, kid out of something. Do you know? And what ends up happening is that the guru tells the kid to do one thing, the kid fails. The kid just doesn't listen, does the opposite. It's weird. You know, not even the opposite, just doesn't do the thing, right? 
And so the guru asks a couple times, still the kid doesn't do it. Then the guru is like, Jesus Christ, you know? And it's like, there's this time where it's raining. So the kid's waiting somewhere. The guru's like, hey kid, you know, take my jacket. I'm going to get a quick shower or something in the river. Like this ancient story, guys, I don't know. I think people just shower in rivers all the time. <laughs> and what happens? is that the guru comes back and sees the kid has dropped, has dropped it like the guru's jacket on the ring. He's like, oh my God, even a simple task, this simple, this kid couldn't do, do you know? And so the guru suddenly gets this feeling, he's like, maybe this kid needs to get enlightened by God's word or something. So they have this thing in India and in many traditions, not just Indian tradition, um, where it is in some sense mantras. So the guy gives this kid some mantras to write down and he, he has, I don't know, some sort of paper-like thing, some sort of board or something. He gives the kid something to write on. And he gives the kid like some sort of pencil too and the kid, he tells the kid, keep writing this sacred mantra. And I don't know what the mantra was. Let's say it was Om or something. The kid's like Om, 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 Om. Imagine the kid's writing OMG, OMG. <laughs> The mantra, the mantra of the ancient times was Om. The mantra of modern times is O M G O M G. <laughs> Anyways, the kid is just writing. Okay, the kid is writing uh, these mantras. The kid listens strangely, and the guy's like, "Good, good, keep doing it," you know. And then suddenly, like some of his other disciples come around, and they're like, "Yo, there's a fight going on. There's something going on," you know, between the other disciples coming out fix this right so the guy tells the kid all right kid just do this just write the names of god i'll be back you know and the guy runs he wants to go handle the problem elsewhere he goes out the guru goes to put out another fire and so what happens is the guru goes and fixes that issue and suddenly realizes, oh my God, it's been like a couple hours. <clears throat> he goes there and he sees that this kid has been writing so much that the pencil or something, I don't know, something has been, the, the, the chalk or whatever he's given the kid has been destroyed and the kid is using his like hands, like it's the edge of the chalk. And it's like this savage thing where this kid is so innocently just doing the action, doing the task, doing the exercise. And the guru sees this and suddenly gets shocked. And this is a story, of course, I read somewhere online, I think. I read it or heard it, I don't know. But like, so what happens is um, the guru goes and hugs the kid and says, oh my God, this kid is realized. He understands this kid had a strange concentration and that concentration wasn't meaningless. Do you know? That means sometimes in life you just, you're given a certain hand and you go with it. You know what I mean? Like literally you're given certain hands, <laughs> physical hands and you just go with it. <laughs> And so the way I resonated with this story, guys, was that I don't know. It's the honesty of the fool that is a strange endurance that is at the end of the lifetime a heavenly access. I don't know how to say it. Sometimes like being a fool and an illusion it has good karma. <laughs> You know, being being like a, you know, a genius in an illusion is like pretty stupid, guys. <laughs> oh, man.
Okay, nice. Chat section's popping, guys. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> I'm just reading the comments, guys. <laughs> So, interesting conversation, guys, you know. <clears throat> I don't know, like on some level, I'm looking at the chat section, and I'm like, how do the people in the chat section even know what each other are talking about? <laughs> but anyways, guys, <clears throat> guys I, I, I'm just sharing this idea. The world is literally like a, like a chunk of clay. Your eyes and your DNA sculpts your inner realms out of it. And then your inner realms are compared to the outer realms. And if they are too distinct, you get, uh, you're get you either inclined towards the inner or the outer. The best thing is to be in the middle way, the middle, middle ground. So you can say when you're in your inner realms, uh, let me say it like this, when you're in your outer realms, when a being there, the attention of the being, I'm saying it's attributeless. So imagine like, like the Yoga Patanjali Sutra's consciousness is like a glass orb. So when the glass orb is on the outer realms, <clears throat> how can I tell you? It is like, it is like a solid state. When the attention is between the inner and outer realms. It's a liquid state of mind. And when the attention is fully on the unknown, it's a gas state of mind. Just entertain this substance-oriented substance, substance -oriented kind of metaphor, you know? Just think about it. Think about it that it's not that we are physical and it's not that we're, it's not that we're 100% physical and 100% non-physical. It's just that um, I personally feel we're oscillating between them. That means throughout the day, rather than me feeling like one person, I feel like, like it was. It was like this where I just felt like one, one person at the end of the day. But then I had this sort of micro attention to my moment. And then it wasn't like uh, the game of the personality anymore. It's like the personality is a crucial part of the moment, but it is not the only thing in the moment. That means there is certain states where I call them beyond, they are beyond the language threshold. And if the human being doesn't have comfort, like literally if you look, like you know what's hilarious? So many people, guys, they dislike so many things in this life, but so many things they don't even care about. You know, the guy walks past the tree, doesn't even look at the squirrel on the tree. The person doesn't even care. The person, even if they, even if the squirrel was being hurt or something, something happened to the squirrel, the guy doesn't see, the person doesn't see it, and therefore the person can't even care. Do you know? That means we can say everybody has a huge morality, a, a huge sense of responsibility, but nobody cares for that huge sense of responsibility. You know? <clears throat> for me, it's kind of strange. You know, it's 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 like at first it is the it is the human story at first you're you're just like yo what kind of character am i in this you know what kind of world am i in you know it, it's honestly like a video game literally <laughs> i think the person who made the first video game ever was like yo i just made a world guys <laughs> You know, guys, here's the thing. It is normal to touch, let's say your hand touches fire or something and your hand burns and you suffer. There is a sort of pain, okay? There's a sort of direct suffering. And then there's a sort of suffering where it's like the person before touching the fire, their, their mind is burning their finger. They're like, no, no, I feel it burnt. Like, like so much of it is psychology. I was like, guys, I don't know, but I was, I was kind of like, 
I remember when I was first introduced to scientific ideas, there was the idea of energy, and there was the idea of energy that cannot be created or, or, or destroyed. <clears throat> that means, what, what are you going to say about energy? It's just energy, you know, like imagine like a showtime. <laughs> Where it's like another day with energy. <laughs> Guys, honestly, I'm just saying there's a certain level of suffering which is real. There's a certain level of suffering that's real in the inner realms. When the person is overwhelmed, and this happens, something that most people don't realize, in an altered state of mind chemically, <clears throat> for example, through intoxication or something, what happens is that the discrimination between the inner and outer realm ends. You know, Terence McKenna, I respect this man in many, in, 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 from many angles of the universe, but uh, there was something that he said, Terence McKenna said, this scholar, and Terence McKenna is pretty much, um, when you want to understand, like I got introduced to Terence McKenna, he's an incredible scholar on culture and civilization, pretty much. And Terence said, The, Terence McKenna, the scholar guy, is pretty much like he was raised in America at the time where, I don't know, um, he, he was a psychedelic explorer, explorer of our time. He was somebody who was just going around the world trying to see how plants are affecting his brain, how, he, the human brain, you know. <clears throat> Terence McKenna said he gave psychedelic plants pretty much to this Tibetan Buddhist monk and the Tibetan Buddhist monk like went through the whole experience, put a towel over his head or something <clears throat> and the monk tells Terence that it's the lesser lights and I was always wondering why, how is it that it's the lesser lights <clears throat> and then I noticed it's the lesser lights because it is technically not doing anything with the light. It's literally like, imagine, uh, imagine it's like this. Either uh, imagine there's a bridge, <clears throat> and there's two worlds. This bridge is connecting. Okay, so this bridge breaks in three ways. Either one world, uh, the, the world on the uh, left side of the bridge breaking, either the world on the le right side of the bridge breaking, or the bridge breaking. Okay, or the bridge breaking. So in some sense, I can say that if the, if the action is significant to you as a physical outcome, you see, it, it's kind of strange because <clears throat> it is very hard to wonder if we're actually physical. That means it's, it's, it's hard to wonder, not in the sense that like I, I, I can touch a table right now, I'm holding this coffee cup in my hand. I mean, I'm not doubting this physicality, but I'm saying what it, it's like, yes, on some level, I am holding a cup in, in my objective realms in my hand, you know, but, but the mind is not an object. So check this out. Ask yourself this, guys. This is a good question. I'm going to ask this from the people in, in the chat section. So, first question, is your mind an object? So, anybody who feels... <clears throat> so, anybody who's, who, who's um, tuning into the talk, um, I've asked the question, is your mind an object? If people can just give yes, no answers, you can even type Y, N, or whatever. I just want to see how many people feel their mind is an object. 
And then the next question would be, <clears throat> if the mind isn't an object, how am I holding this cup in my hand? That would be the second question, you know? Guys, here's the interesting options, I think, you know. Either there is truth, either there is no truth, either there is truth obstructed, either there is no truth obstructed. Or, the most intense of them all, the truth, we are the truth, and we're looking at it for eons endlessly outside of ourselves, you know? The person's like, how, how do I find love? How do I find, you know, d divinity, you know? And then the angels came and said, hey, buddy, ask yourself, don't ask us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm feeling a bit silly this morning, more than usual. <laughs> So guys, an interesting comment in the chat section. According to quantum physics, biology, and according to quantum physics, biology, and neurology, there is no you. Well, here's the thing. If there is no you, then how can there be certainty? So how can how can there be quantum physics? Who is if there is no you, who is the quantum physics, biology, and neurology for? Like are scientists insane? If they feel there is no you, but at the same time, they're every day going and trying to find theories on explaining the universe. So who are they explaining it for if there is no you? You see, I feel there is you, guys. I just feel if we choose, if we are stubborn and want to see everything in one dimension, there will be conflict. But if we see things multidimensionally, the conflict actually is divided. It's not that the conflict's gone, the conflict is divided, you know? You know, guys, th this is um, what uh, this is. Uh, I'm looking at the chat section and, and just to add my view. Uh, this is known as the cosmological argument, and the cosmological argument in philosophy is pretty much saying, "How was there the first design? How was there a design?" Do you know, like I can understand emptiness. Yeah, emptiness is nothing, it's empty. But how could there be a source? Like, so you see the caveman's hands, or like like we built, like Edison with his hands built the light bulb, you know? <clears throat> I feel that we don't know enough about our minds to be certain. We literally as a species don't know enough to claim everything to be supremely true. You know, this is why I always keep it in context. When I looked at, when I saw ants, guys, I remember when, <laughs> when it, like I remember seeing an ant and wondering if I'm an ant to something bigger. <clears throat> 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 
guys, you gotta check something out, right? So I'm, I have a different school of thought. I don't see the ego as a bad thing. Some people see the ego as a bad thing. They're like, yo, I gotta get rid of this, uh, you know, uh, blindfold. What I'm telling you, the ego is simply any time your attention evokes as a subjective self, any time. Like you could literally be walking and looking at a cloud, okay, and in some sense, suddenly think you're seeing your own face in the clouds, okay? I mean, honestly, if you see your own face in the clouds, you definitely have an ego. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I, my view is, here's the thing. When we play the ego game, you know what happens? We just point fingers and we get tired. That's the ego game, you know? For me, language is a technology. These words that I'm using, they display something, but they are not me. They're like, a, they're, they're literally, <clears throat> like I can't tell you how when you suddenly see thoughts aren't, are not you, then what is here? And I'm telling you, we, our knowledge, our methods of comprehending things is as a doer. Do you know what I mean? That means we have to be a person to do, you have to be something, be an individual to do stuff, to do activities here. Do you know? Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm telling you, it's a realization that before we're individuals, there's something there. And in, in Mr. Within's experience, that's a simplicity. Right now, us, us speaking, for example, in the chat section and whatnot, this is a complex display. Literally, like, you know, animal, all animals in nature are looking. If we were, like, speaking in a park right now, animals will look at us and be like, what are these guys doing? <laughs> guys, I'm telling you this. There is a philosophy that says that the individuality of the person can be perceived to be in an organism. So we can say life inevitably, because it is changing, changes everybody, but people have a choice of stepping into their next moment in accordance to who they were or who they can be. Do you know, there was a time where I wouldn't give myself room to breathe on this planet. I wouldn't let myself even be a thought. Do you know, it's, it's, let me tell you, I think something happened in my youth that freaked me out or something. Like sometimes shyness, it could, it, like a reason for shyness, like in my youth, I was very shy. Uh, I think a reason for shyness could be intimidation too soon. That means a child's mind that doesn't know how to handle an intense situation, but experiences something intense. <clears throat> Guys, I'm just saying, imagine the, the, the meaning that you give life or you, the truth you think you see in life. I want you to imagine that is, the, that is like um, you drawing a painting on, on, on a piece of paper and thinking that piece of paper is the world. It's an activity. I think mystical awareness at its core is, is an awareness to how the mind is the stillness where the body moves in. The body is the movement of the mind, the mo is the movement of the being, the mind is like the stillness of the being. So you can say, <clears throat> imagine, so you know what's going on? It's kind of like, you can say we are creating, like it's, it's an incredible philosophical, point guys to think about what does it really mean to exist because in deep sleep we don't exist but we don't call that death right so i so we call death the, the physical dissolution of the body 
Okay, but you see what I mean? The mind is way more mysterious than we've been told. What is this? <laughs> Guys, one day I hope to see, you know, like, um, how, what is it, guys? I wanted to attempt to build a school of advanced communication in the future. And the reason I wanted to build that school was just to see how far human communication can go. Do you know human communication? The, uh, the concept of communication is not just limited. People have communicated to plants. People have communicated to... What do you call it? Animals. People have communicated to animals of their own species, human, Homo sapiens. People in, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> especially near the Mount Shasta area, do you know? Those people feel they're communicating to extraterrestrials. So people are, <laughs> do you know? So I'm saying people are communicating not just with their inner realms, but with their outer realms. I think this is the main point. You're not just the communication of your inner realms. You're also communicating with your inner realms. <clears throat> that means I think that Mr. Within's main contribution is really that there is a room behind your eyes. And that room is not per se empty. It is as full as the world was seen. On some level, guys, I've experienced myself as just momentum. Do you know? Just, just as if speed without direction. It's just wherever the attention goes. Like, just try it right now. I don't know how many people have tried this, but it's called single pointed, uh, single, uh, um, oh, single pointed concentration. There we go. So guys, <clears throat> think of it this way. Think of right now, imagine you had an incredible instrument in your hand and you wanted to figure out this instrument. You would have to engage it, right? You would have to play the instrument. So now, imagine the mind is an advanced instrument, an advanced technology. And how would one go about, in some sense, uh, you can say, um, a mastering their mind and how they are instrumented in reality in a certain way. The poet Rumi, the poet Rumi, like there, there are certain poet guys, they're called mystical hymns. There are certain poetry, there, it's like part of the poetic universe where the person writing the poet, writing the poem, suddenly finds it, finds the self in an omniscience. So certain people, you read their poetry, it's as if, like, the universe is saying the poem. Like, Hafez has this uh, poet poem where he says, um, The sun doesn't look at the earth and say, you owe me. And then Rumi says, look, what, look at what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. So guys, this is this is very interesting, you know, because you can see even like you see it in movies. Like people are owning pets like accessories. <clears throat> Human beings when they treat other beings as objects, they will feel more like an object. You know, that means sometimes I'm like, maybe it's too overwhelming for the world to think that it's immaterial. Because if, it, if we thought there was life beyond the sensory perception, we would feel this strange guilt. You know? Life changes you in ways where it either changes the self 
or the concept, the major primal, the conscious con concept, or the unconscious context. Now, the unconscious context is always changing. That means right now, when you look around you, like even a person may be bored in some room, okay? But that person will instantly realize in the world there is things happening. <clears throat> you know, I feel life is like a mountain where everybody's trying to go as far as they can to get the best view because they know at some point they would have to climb down the mountain. The, the indistinguishable or inseparable nature of matter and consciousness. That's what we need to focus on. So when life changes, it's a relationship between how you're an object and also how you're a subject in accordance to your body and in accordance to your world. So that means you are like viewing matter you're viewing matter as a, as, a, as a subject, but you're viewing the subject, you're viewing the subject attributelessly. You know what that means? That means imagine in one view, yeah, human beings are just this. In another view, imagine there, were, there was an endless multidimensionality. You know, that means those people who thought they have auras, now imagine you have endless, endless till, till the edge of the universe, endless, endless spheres of endless, endless subtler bodies, imagine. You know, somebody once explained human character in an incredible way. They said that <clears throat> you life is kind of built, the honor, the joy, the feeling, the emotion, the strength is built based is built based on the small battles you win. So imagine somebody who hasn't achieved, um, how would I say it? Like imagine you're someone who in any system, you have found yourself at uh, literally the, a point where you can't go any lower in the system. So the good thing about uh, the lowest point in any system is that it gets to experience the strongest lift up, the strongest lift up, you know? That means it's like, for example, the son of a billionaire and that billionaire who was self-made, the, the, that billionaire who was self-made, for example, that billionaire has seen both worlds, but the billionaire's son has only seen one world. You see what I mean? I feel on some level, life is like, it's like, Communication is like writing the script in, in on spot. You know what I mean?
I feel when life is a temporary system, when the creature becomes aware of its mortality, that's when you begin wondering how important attitude is. And pretty much when you notice the sands on the hourglass kind of falling, you, co you, you come to this sort of conclusion of the most in the, in, the, uh, within, in the shortest time. Do you know what I mean? That means, I'm telling you, ma skill, mastery, anything you do in this life, it's about how important it is for you. I don't think, I think like, instead of like the law of attraction, like, I kind of got a bit shocked, guys. I'm, I'm telling you guys, those people who follow law of attraction, you're going to attract a lot of law of attraction books. That's it. <laughs> What I'm saying is that really it's something to pilot and no one can really tell you this. This is something that you will only realize. You will realize a sort of ultimate presence of yourself without any interruption. That means it's as if you just like sitting somewhere and being like, all right, who knows how long we're here. Who am I while I am here? And then, suddenly you start hearing lightning storms in the distance. Even though it's a sunny day in your mind, your inner realms begin evoking. You recognize that the attention can move inwards and outwards, simultaneously. So that means you can literally walk on the street and you can literally in your inner realms find, find the geometry of the street change. <clears throat> so what it is, is we have this defined reality and we uh, don't feel it's perfect. And because we want to evolve and everything is changing also due to the entropic nature of the universe. What can we say? Even space is moving, as scientists say. <laughs> Guys, do you know that there's this saying that's, that says, it's a Tibetan saying, it says unless you conquer anger, your enemies will be inexhaustible. And then one asks the question afterwards, how do you conquer anger? And how you conquer anger is by wondering how it's arising. That means, I'm telling you, it, it's like, uh, this was one of the most important things that I learned in this life, that oftentimes when it comes to communication anywhere, in any state, part of the space-time continuum, <laughs> it, you need to have mutual respect for the world where the feet are on, do you know? 
but you don't need to have mutual trust. That mutual respect means you see the same table, you know? That means it's like when you see a, a great conversation in my youth, like uh, I could tell you like um, my father would have these gatherings where he would speak and you know it was like uh, something that most people don't know about Persian culture. Most people think Iran is just a, a religious nation. But so many people have underground meetings talking about philosophy, psychology and the world. You know, there's a hidden intellectual dimension to, for example, the nation of Iran that most people don't see. <clears throat> there, it is with every nation. I think no nation is stupid. I think the moment one person literally looks online and sees something, their mind opens up, you know? Like a transformer in the movie that sees a better car and transforms and they get, you know, big sponsorship deals from... <laughs> You see, I, I, I wondered about um, <clears throat> before Buddha was born, what was the world like? Before Buddha was born, you know? That means all Buddhists should be listening to me, right? <laughs> before Buddha was born, um, meditation existed way before Buddha, of course, but Buddhism didn't <laughs> exist before Buddha, you know? Buddha, there's many stories of him being pretty much this prince that he's born with like this, um, what do you call it, like this tattoo or, or birthmark of a wheel on his foot, on the, on the bottom of his foot. Like, that's a blessed spot for a birthmark to be, I think, by the way. At the bottom of the foot, it's strange, but it's like the most convenient spot, I think. But anyways, so the father of Buddha is like, looks at this holy man who, who's there and was like, what does this mean? And the holy man's like, your son will either become a great emperor like you. <laughs> the guy's like, I gotta say this, or he, this guy's gonna kill me. <laughs> Anyways, the le legend has it, the guy says he's going to be an emperor like you or he's going to become a great sage. And I thought that was literally the best answer that guy could give a king. Like the king's like, tell me the future of my son. And the guy's like, all right, your son could be great or not great. <laughs> you know, that guy was so much smarter than the king at the time, I would say, the, the, the sage who said that. But anyway, so, so Buddha's father, Siddhartha's father, is um, Gautama Siddhartha is Buddha's real name. Buddha means awakened one, guys. That's it. Anytime you hear Buddha, it's not like his name was Buddha. Like, you know, we get a time machine and go we're like, show us, show us ID that you're Buddha on paper. <laughs> You know, this was the <clears throat> the massive realization. Buddha, pretty much his father, keeps him imprisoned in this artificial life and he steps out of this artificial life. When he steps out of this artificial life, um, <clears throat> this artificial life that he's kind of living, he suddenly realizes he goes with his servant buddy named Ananda. And... What happens is he pretty much sees people are dying, people get old, people get sick, there's so many problems in life, and he's like, yo, people are suffering, and I've just been in my own castle walls. 
you know and buddha in that moment he's already experienced the the wealth of luxury so he all that is left for him now is the honest exploration you know most people at buddha's time most children they they were designed to go and become high members in society but buddha was the son of an emperor so he didn't have he he had seen it he had seen everything you know and so what happens is that Buddha goes on this journey, he tries asceticism, <clears throat> he pretty much tries, there was this sort of strange Brahmanic ritualistic practice which was messed up, it was just savage primitive ritual. And what it was, was that the, the people would fast and they thought when they would die it was like a divine experience, but it was stupid. Because it's like when you die, then it, like the experiencer is re being reduced, so the experience is technically less. You know. So, anyways, Buddha suddenly is about to starve. Me. I don't know guys, pretty much this girl brings Buddha rice before he dies and Buddha eats that rice and realizes these weird practices, ascetic practices aren't the way. He realizes that he can't avoid the truth. It's like you're sitting on a chair And uh, truth is about getting up to experience this thing. And so when you're sitting on the chair, it's as if so, and for eons, endless archetypes could come and try to pull you out off this chair. But you will only get up the chair if you want to. What that means is we right now are thinking we are just the domain of our biological being. But Mr. Within is saying, if we were to really look closely at our sciences, to look at how we're really telling the story of life, <clears throat> it is an abstract simulation, it's a linguistic simulation. So right now, how am I speaking to you? Through language. How are you hearing this? Through language. But when I use these words, the images I have behind my eyes for the words that I'm sharing are not going to be the same images you will have in your eyes. So technically, every person that has spoken, those words were like this, technically, a percentage of it, an ambiguous pattern. That means on some level, nobody knows what anyone is ever saying. <clears throat> because we don't have each other's eyes, you know, if we were all 
all our brains were connected to a computer, sure. But but like because we don't have the same eyes, it, we can't expect you know a sort of unity all the way. You know, you can put a brain on a scale, but you cannot put a mind. A mind should be defined <coughs> as um, So, um, Ivan, um, to comment on what you're saying about pragmatic da data conversion is possible. See, here's, here's what I think. I think it's, it, it's a situation where literally we are in our minds living in a video game. Like, think about it. Just think about the simulate, the correlation it has to a simulation, right? So you, in some sense, there's a person behind the screen, and only in that screen, there is, in some sense, how can I say it, the existence of the character. So these multiplayer online games that are like, in, like I don't know, billion, do billion dollar industries or whatever, the gaming industry, let, let's Google this. So guys, check this out. I just Googled it. It says $120 billion video game industry, 68.5 billion global mobile gaming industry. Do you get, can you guys just take that in? So what does that mean? That means that 120 billion that money is coming from users. That means tons of people are being drawn <clears throat> towards cyberspace culture.
By the way, guys, anybody who has questions, feel free to ask all the questions that um, people ask. I can, uh, at the end of it, I, I want to try the speed speed answer thing. So anybody can ask a question, I'm going to just kind of like rush through them with like a machete in, a, in the Amazons. Yeah. Guys, I'm just saying that the mind, <clears throat> once it wonders about the knower, believe it or not, if it's honest, comes to the unknown. When you come to the unknown, you have to get a sort of contentment with your limitation. You will not get a contentment with your limitation unless you become grateful for it. Guys, the linguistic simulation is a technology. The person should not identify with it. You should, language is a tool. Do you know, it is not meant to be truth. You know, in certain moments in history, words were treated like truth. But now the world has reached a point where <clears throat> it is forgetting itself, you know? So in, in like a multiplayer online game, all our physical existence right now, each physical human being, their physical body is on one planet. So our outer realms are the same. That is an advantage. It is not a disadvantage. Okay, for the species. Our outer realms are the same. If we were all in a, if everybody in the chat section was in like a movie theater, we were all seeing the same movie. You know what I mean? But, but in our inner realms, that's when it's our own way of responding to the world that is accessible to us. So I am saying after some point, we have to design systems that transcend the, the limitations of the linguistic simulation. This is why I keep saying in these talks, you know, people need to journal their inner realms. People need to begin asking questions as if they were on an island and they were, or they were the first one on the mountain. <clears throat> I am telling you, you must fascinate yourself into the, uh, into you, the own continuity, into your own continuity of existence. You know, guys, it was kind of strange. <clears throat> In my youth, often they would tell me, be responsible, be responsible. Uh, and I would, I would think, but I didn't create the world. How can I be responsible for it? <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? Sometimes we enter the world with a mindset where we don't see the whole picture. So that's why I'm saying you got to treat language like a technology. Just because I'm saying these words doesn't mean the, just these sounds that a creature makes is the ultimate truth of everything. I am, I am trying to use my mind as a flashlight in the, in, the, in the darkness of this cosmos. After four billion years, rare moment, it's like shocking, rare moment, we suddenly became conscious of ourselves. If you think about it, the universe has been a way more silent place <clears throat> before we existed to it. So it's kind of strange. On some level, um, th the universe exists before we do, but on some level, we need to exist before the universe exists for us. Do you get it? It's, it's a fascinating relationship. Every, every day I wake up, I'm like, why this? Why this? <clears throat> that means it was very interesting. In, in, in the Upanishads, they would say not this. They would say neti neti. So the, the guy would meditate and come and say, yo, is this truth, guru? And the guru would be like, not this. Not this. <laughs> the guru was probably saying, not this guy again. <laughs> the, 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 he, the Upanishads would say not this. Because you're not looking to find something. Because re in reality, the mind is not an object. The brain is made of cell is made of cells. So technically, the brain brain is objective. But the activity of the brain, which is some sort of projected mind, because right now 
You know, I, I was shocked to see a neurologist say that uh, free will is an illusion. So if free will is an illusion, who, who, are we, who are we fighting for freedom for in all our global institutions? <clears throat> so free will, we, right now, from a scientific view, it's, it's a bit more shocking. Do you see? Because in, in some sense, electron, like an atomic vision, it's like electrons are simulating personhood. Okay? On an, uh, like right now as I'm speaking to you, every atom in my body has electrons in it. You know? <laughs> like there's, there's, there's so many tiny particles that are making up this existence of me that on some level, it's like, <clears throat> you know, the elements, the element doesn't die. You know, I was making this point about energy, that energy cannot be created or destroyed, and we are conscious beings, and because we need energy to survive, that means we are energy that's conscious of itself. Right now, in the human framework, in this plane of existence, it's a conditional awareness. That means we've suddenly wakened up, awoken in the mind of an unknown God in the mind of an unknown cosmos, in the mind of an unknown intelligence, in the mind of some unknown happening, <clears throat> whatever way you want to engage it. And eventually you're going to notice something fascinating, that as we become more intelligent as a species, we're going to realize the value of our common commonality. Do you know? That means... The, the similarity and the design of a bee and other bees and the sounds they make, the interaction, the, the sensors they have and whatnot. <clears throat> you see, like, the bee doesn't attack another bee. You never see... I don't, I, I'm, pro I'm probably bees kill each other, but like... <laughs> like, I don't know how many people know this, but in a... If you had two beehives beside one another and you change the queens and you put them in each other, in, dip, in each queens, like you, you switch the queens of the beehives, their location, you would see all the bees from both beehives would invade and try to kill that imposter queen. The loyalty of bees is unimaginable. That means all the bees notice something is different. You know what it is, guys? It's like realizing whatever, whatever you have considered in this life, it's a value. I think the language of nature is experiential value. And we can say experience is containing existence. We have been thinking existence has been projecting experience, but the discovery and the evolution towards the collective mind is a, is, is a sort of recognition that it's the mind moving the body. So right now, move your hand in front of you. Whoever is listening to me, just move your hand in front of you. Just move your hand in front of you. Now, as you just keep it moving, okay? Just, <laughs> just move your hand in front of you. You know, like make your elbow as if like a 90 degree angle and just move your hand like 90 degrees. Just just playfully do this, you know. And then as you're doing it, wonder, in some sense, first think about doing it, then stop thinking about it and think about something else and you see the action can still continue. So what you know what I think is going on? <clears throat> I think our mind is leaving a trail in matter and that trail is its memory. I think the mind 
is an energetic relationship way, that is much more superior than how conception is that we can talk about. That means, guys, um, the term, the language threshold that I've designed, it was so necessary because you don't know. I came to a point where I realized my eyes and both my mind sight and my inner realms For me, I, I honestly will tell you that I don't know how human beings should live. I, I don't think we will ever know it. I think it's, it's in movement. I think literally it's like a song is played and those who can hear the song and dance to it, they get pulled towards continuity in this plane of existence. I've asked myself sometimes, guys, I've asked myself, I've looked at strangely the palm of my hand and I've looked at all those lines <clears throat> and I've wondered about the various ways the meaningless stretch, stretches out. Ah, a stranger to tomorrow.
You know, guys, I'm going to attempt something I've never attempted before in these talks. I'm going to share, um, I usually, I've kept this for later on in my works, but I'm going to share with you how one in some sense can pilot in their inner realms. And the first thing is you locate the outer realms. And the instant you have located the, the outer realms, you notice that they are outer because there is an inner. So once you locate the outer realm, once you notice that you're a physical creature, then you suddenly are comfortable enough to wonder what it is. You know, what it is beyond that. Do you know? So when you wonder about what is beyond that, you're given two crossroads, you know? You're either going towards the void or you're going towards the infinite. So you require not only to confront physical reality, but you also need to confront how physical reality can move towards the infinite and can move towards the void. And when you find a sort of contentment with how overwhelming those directions can be, then your inner realms become accessible to you and the best way to access them is like a field. So what does that mean? That means we have our ancestors, every person before us, and they, we, we have only lived as bodies on this earth. Do you see what I mean? But now it is a time to, in some sense, realize we can live as minds while we're here. So I'm like, wait a minute, it doesn't matter what the explanation of life is, because life is here now. So it's like when the car is running, you don't, you don't, it's like, the, it's like an airplane in the middle of the air, and the pilot is in the airplane, and imagine the pilot's like, like, whoa, why are we in the air? Like, no, it's like the system is already set in motion. And I can tell you that the next kind of great intelligence that our civilization needs is not a sort of, you know, a person sitting on a rock with their fingers underneath their chin, uh, philosophizing about how what the past should should you know what regret should we what we shouldn't regret about the past. You see, every moment of your life, something moves forward or something doesn't. It's like either your self changes and throughout the day or your world changes. Do you know? That means if you literally don't move from where you are, yourself, you will notice yourself changing. <laughs> but if you keep moving, your world is changing, so you will constantly appear as new selves. And this is kind of like the same way Herak I'm saying this in the same way Heraclitus says, no man steps in the same river. Uh, and it's not and twice, and it's not the same river, and it's not the same man. What that means is our minds, because they have an access to the fourth dimension, which is time, can separate physical events. So Albert Einstein says we created time so that everything doesn't happen all at once. That means technically when we wonder about what is behind, beyond uh, time, it would be a moment where everything is happening at once. This is why, Mr. This is why I'm telling you guys you need to confront be comfortable with all physical phenomena, then you also need to be comfortable with the physical phenomena going at an unfathomable speed, and then you also need to be comfortable with the physical phenomena becoming non-physical. That means, pretty much, it's like, sure, the, the, we can say the archaic view was birth and death. Those words were are, are archaic to me, at least, as a person. Do you know? Because it is not like birth and death. Do you know? It is, it is like conscious... Wake it, it is it is how would I say it? Imagine the cosmos is alive and you're in a symbiosis with it. That's it. Imagine that if you have dared be an individual in this cosmos, then you must have the strength to stare at this vast cosmos. That means there's a sort of independence, sure, yeah, the person thinks there's someone. But then there's an independence where the person looks at this cosmic landscape, sees the void, sees the vastness, sees the infinitude of the stars and the galaxies, and uh, even the mysteries of the black holes. And then the person looks at this um, immeasurable sky, this sky that no ruler can measure or conquer. And so it will become a situation where we will automatically realize that we, we have been defeated in our outer realms, and then the inner realms remain. But what do we do with the inner realms? Well, strangely, when a human being, we have to maintain 
our physical existence. So what your inner realms are always active when you're trying to continue as as a creature trying to survive. You know what I mean? Like as long as you're engaged with um, survival activities and how Maslow says, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological needs. It's like, you know, the person can talk about like, you know, <laughs> you can talk about, um, of course, language has a freedom that reality doesn't have, guys. We gotta understand this. Language is the extension of reality behind our eyes. I honestly feel like this is what needs to happen. And if this is a calling for anybody who hears this, you know, just like the Frankfurt School where there was a sort of political innovation in ideology, I feel now we need to have yeah, instead of like that kind of, we need to have a similar Frankfurt School, but we need to have it for language. So we need to create. I don't know how to say it, guys, but it's beautiful. Sometimes it's like you make a move, the self moves in the moment, then you watch the world move and you enjoy that. And then the self moves and you enjoy that and the world. So it is te technically a texture of joy. So what would be incredible is that the human being notices that in silence and stillness, they, be they become the complete awareness of their activity. That means when you literally just stop moving, just wherever you are, just for 10 minutes, just whatever, just find a moment where you can just sit and there's no meditation, nothing. You're just sitting down as a human being. That's it. You're just literally going into a booth. Imagine like a telephone booth, one of those they had in London. <laughs> and so you've gone into this <coughs> um, uh, kind of booth. And this booth is literally you literally stepping out of the simulation of the day. That means it's like... Even though I'm talking to you right now, even though I'm telling you guys there is the concept of the language threshold and the, even that beyond language, but I'm still a person. Do you see what I mean? That means I realized that the issue was, look at how hilarious was it. The guy came and said, yo, I'm an Indian yogi and started dressing like an Indian yogi. Do you know? If we consider we have a mind, what separates that mind from the body? Right now, I notice that my physical body is instantly here. 
But what the mind appears to be, it seems to be existing through the space. So man's relationship with his own mind is his actual relationship with space as an intelligence. So sometimes you can think space is intelligent, but you're the intelligence in the room of that space. It's like the coffee you thought it was hot until you drank it. Who knows how the world moves? We are like pigments, we're like each human being is like a pixel on the screen of how humanity is advancing. You look at your personhood, <clears throat> your personhood it is in some sense is it not limited to your memories, to your awareness, to your care of wanting to see who you are. For me, what is fascinating, again, is, 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 is just noticing the inseparability of imagination and memory, how they are occurring in the, in the same state of inner viewing, which is witnessing. That means right now I'm looking at this coffee cup, okay? I am not this coffee cup. <clears throat> when I close my eyes, I'm not seeing something, I'm not looking with my biological eyes, but I see image. That image behind our eyes, <clears throat> which we ascribe to imagination or we call memory or whatever you call it, I sometimes have called it uh, subtler planes of abstraction. So the person has access, it's like, it's like if you're an antenna, you're picking up on more subtler signals. Nobody has your eyes. So when life changes you, nobody really sees that you other than you. <clears throat> and it's strange because if communication is something that requires effort, and effort will not be there unless there's direction. That means uh, unless you realize it took us four billion years to be able to direct ourselves, that independence becomes valuable then treating life like a healthy adventure is, 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 is in some sense engaging. <clears throat> For me, the system right now, Civilization 1.0, I call it, is inefficient. I call it a fax machine civilization because it feels to me that underdeveloped. I'm speaking in 2020 right now. I feel that the civilization could become more advanced if, in some sense, the educational system changed its values for how it is designing its curriculums. Everything in life that a person wants to project, even I'm, I'm speaking to you right now, it's like I'm speaking through various levels. So I look at a concept, but I look at it through multiple contexts. When I look at it from multiple contexts, there's an, there's an innate infusion of those contexts. 
So I, w I would say in some sense, every phenomena can relate to an another phenomena. You know, Buddha says that the object is empty, it is man's mind which imbues it with a nature. So just like how that child sees its teddy bear as its best friend, your mind is looking at this object and, for example, considering it as a coffee cup. So I'm saying, dear human being, it's all about your attention. Study your attention. Your attention is your world, it is your meaning, and at the same time when you realize it is your pilot, like your, your, your steering wheel, you navigate. You navigate the cosmos that has appeared in your inner realms. You know, for me, I have a sort of... I thought the spirit of honor was lost. I thought the civilization that made so many mistakes, how could it be proud of itself ever? And then I realized anytime you look at the past, yeah, there's, there's, you can endlessly see mistakes. Do you know, as, as the future goes, because we're getting more of sophisticated awareness of the answers. I feel the mystery still stands. I feel that the educational system can give us many mental, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, thin metals as it wants to people. But really, the pursuit of knowledge surpasses individual identity. That means, even in Vedic mythology, the higher dimensions of the world, there's no longer an entity relationship. There's no longer a creature in a world. You become av an avatar of knowledge. That means you, in some sense, become a creature that has looked at life with a sort of strange clergy to discover the opposites. And when you discover the opposites, it becomes, in some sense, your choice of what you do. So you see, the narrative is, is like a mask that is not making you realize you have the mask on. When you take the mask off, it is not, it's the same face. Like imagine you have a mask on and you touch your face and you feel like dollar store plastic. <laughs> and then you take off the mask and then you suddenly feel your priceless face. And <laughs> so I'm saying like, it's, 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 that's the difference. It's like, we have to, it's like the solution is not just, um, um, physical objective. It's not just subjective. It's not just emotional. Do you know, it is, it seems to be a movement. It's literally like human beings, every human being that is born right now, if we had an advanced civilization, maybe perhaps would by nature of their interest, imagine we created a utopia, guys. Imagine we created a utopia, a perfect world. Now the child would be born in this perfect world and the child wouldn't have any preferences, but eventually the world will appear as a landscape of options. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? The world will appear as a landscape of options, and so the child will make decisions. So what that means is pretty much children, uh, I feel it's like we're not even, we're not human beings. We are hum the spirit of humanity playing our part. I feel the honor that we will feel in the future. I feel that honor is one where mankind will rise in a way where he will never fall again because he has accessed the master strategy to bypass both the inner and outer extinction. The inner extinction, its bypassing is instantaneous, as the idea of moksha was. In an instant, the world has arose. Guess what? In an instant, it can close. And so we are oscillating between the known and the unknown, the empty and the full, the wisdom and the love. You know, it's, it, it's as if, like, we may not hear it. I, in, in, I remember there was a time where my grandfather passed away. And this was when I was 10 years old and I was just visiting Iran for, like, a little bit. My family, you know, was visiting for the summer. 
I was living in Vancouver <clears throat> before. And so when, when I went to Iran, this news came that my grandfather on the father's side had passed away when I was 10. And imagine someone important that you thought you have time to know suddenly left. So I suddenly realized my grandfather exists only in my memories now. Then I realized the significance of honoring your ancestors. And it's not just your ancestors, it's ultimately all human beings. You know what I mean? That means on some level you are honoring the vision and the design of that human being. Do you know when, when, a, when a human being would pass away, the warriors in the battlefield would come and they would honor the presence of that being. They would honor how they, that was a living life force that moved and came and was something. Do you see? The issue is not that we are inefficient, we are weak, we are a failing civilization. The issue is how we are painting the picture in the first place. And as we can extract wisdom from Zen, <laughs> You know, that means imagine there was a doctor named Zen. And so this guy was literally, like, officially, in a, like, on paper, a Zen doctor. <laughs> imagine your first name is Zen, and your last name is Doctor. You know, and you're like, I'm a Zen doctor. You know, and people are like, what do you mean? And you're like, that's my name, I'm Zen doctor. <laughs> I'm just telling you guys, the world is a playful place. We, we seem to be evolutionary creatures that are just making sophisticated mouth noises, but the, the way we process these mouth noises is so advanced and unique and unknown that we're kind of tapping into a sort of recognition that there may be something as a sort of, there may be a more mysterious substrate to visual reality. So in some sense, it's kind of strange. I'm like, wait a minute, am I the cells of my body or am I the light in my eyes? That means if there wasn't light in my eyes, it's like, it's a deep philosophical question, guys. And I was thinking like, if light wasn't in my eyes, I wouldn't see anything to care for. So it's like right now I am seeing my body visually and I'm saying this is my physical existence, right? Like my, I'm, I'm just looking at my physical being right now, okay? But, but at the same time as I'm looking at my physical being, I know that there will come a time where this physical positioning will change to a point where it will not exist anymore. I've, I've, I've experienced dreams in my, I've died in my dream states. In my, I've had dreams where I've died in the dream. And the experience of it was not a personality. Your personality is only projected. All these archetypes that Carl Jung speaks about, they are there because you are an individual. But it's as if like the moment the physical body, as Guru Padma Sambhava says, goes through, goes through layers of dissolution, these layers of dissolution will inevitably reveal what was there. It's kind of like Socrates where he said, uh, uh, before he was kind of condemned to kind of like, he was sentenced to kind of leave this plane of existence. Socrates said to the people around him pretty much that don't worry about me. Those who have con condemned me, those who have contemned me will have to suffer with material existence to come. But I will go where I will either, where there will either be no Socrates, his famous words in history, no Socrates, where I will go, I will go somewhere where there is no Socrates. That means they like right now. I'm imagine my name is a mean jobber, and sorry. Imagine like Socrates saying something like it's like your name doesn't exist. That means you are going either to pure non-existence, or Socrates says I am going where I will get the answers to all the questions I ever asked in life. Our minds are unknown, our bodies are known, our consciousness oscillates, There's, the world is bigger than our eyes, our eyes seem to touch the void, thoughts come and go, I mean seriously, this world is a, uh, what is this, the universal Cirque du, Cirque du Soleil? <laughs>
Guys, I think it's all about the dimensions you see to your existence. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I've brought paper here, I'm gonna see how I can kind of explain this. Let us say time is a straight line, okay? So I'm drawing a horizontal line on a piece of paper. Let's say this is time. Now, time is going forward, okay? And <clears throat> time is going forward, okay? As time is going forward, we are creatures that I'm literally, I've drawn this line and I'm looking at this line and I'm going to divide it into, let's say, two phases. I'm going to draw, okay, so it has a center, it's the center of the line. Guys, I'm going to take a picture of this and I'll put it on the screen here. I'm going to first explain it though. Time is going forward. Uh, one third of the human life, uh, we're asleep. Okay, one third of your life, the human being is sleeping. Now we are oscillating between wakefulness and consciousness. So that's an incredible thing to consider. So while we while we're awake, we learn from physical reality. When we're asleep, the mind moves the body. When we're awake, the body administers the mind primarily. It's not the only way the mind is administered, but I'm saying like your physical body is pretty much the pen of your attentions, like how you happen as a being. So I'm saying we are seeing this constant um, structure of things breaking apart, coming back together, breaking apart, coming back together. It's as if the universe has a heartbeat and its heartbeat is entropy. You know, I found it very strange. The world is becoming stranger, guys. I was seeing this atheist and theist debate, and I was I felt like I was just seeing uh, two people throw language at each other across stage. <laughs> I feel like it's as if the religious ideology entertained a multidimensional reality. That's the archaic multidimensionality religion or metaphysics or wisdom traditions or whatnot. Modern mo multidimensionality it's as if scientists are saying like God get out of here man. And then they're like, what? Maybe there is a multiverse. Who knows? <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm saying it's not, it's a coin flip. Fighting over a coin flip that's still in the air is meaningless. The coin flip, I think, uh, as long as we're alive, won't fall down. This coin is endlessly flipping. Like it's freaking out. <laughs> So as we go through space and time, we are not 100% aware of space and time. We're not like a 24-7, a light left on 24-7, you know, making your gas bill suffer. <laughs> so it's like we're not a 24-7 energy, energetic expression, or we are, we are an energetic expression, but 
we're not conscious 24 7 right so consciousness is pretty much where we can work as individual objective bodies the conscious waking state is the only time you can actually live as a human being The Japanese would say, I had a saying, there's this Japanese proverb that says, the man is the room he enters. The man is the room he's in. Sorry. The man is the man is the room he's in. Now just check that out. That means if you are, let's say, a saint, but you're in a room with sinners, if you were in Japan, you're a sinner. Do you see what I mean? If you were suddenly in a room, if you were a sinner in a room with saints, you are suddenly a saint. All the sinner, all the saints in the place will be like, this sinner is here for a reason. Maybe he's a saint, you know? What can I say about a river? What can I say? What man can define the shape of a moving system? So as long as the system is moving, definitions are simulations. So I can say the dictionary is literally ink on paper. The shadow, the light, the empty, the full, the fool, the wise. The still, the mover. The silent, the speaker. Your attention is a never before phenomena, never before witnessed phenomena. Like sometimes like <laughs> when I brush my teeth, I feel like I am like the first human being, you know, like <laughs> first human being in my ancestry brushing my teeth with such an advanced tooth. <laughs> <clears throat> Develop an ability to see the big and the small, the small and the big. Realize human beings have a known potential and an unknown potential. And the advancement of the civilization is not fearing the unknown potential and going towards the known potential. Ultimately, guys, because we don't have each other's eyes, but we have each other's world, physical world, we, are, we must use, we must use vision to build that which is never before seen. And so Mr. Within is just asking every living human being to just whatever you do in every day of your life, try the new and tell me if you won't find hidden storehouses of energy in, in your attempt, in your march towards the important. I am telling you, 
you are your human nature is is the language of your conscience and what that means is imagine you have a nature imagine all these yogis saying yo you got a true nature kid go find it you know and so it's like what is that true nature now you can imagine the the na- universe has a nature there's the zen story where this man is meditating in this grassland and a breeze the winds of evolution pass him by and he suddenly gets this next level incredible insight into the world you know and this insight this person gets into the world <clears throat> in the world is so liberating but it's not an ultimate liberation. The guy just sees the nature of reality. Suddenly, it's so many things are making sense to him. He's self-realizing, you know. And in that moment, suddenly, the Zen story, which I read on my up chair, <laughs> the Zen story says there was a dark minion in another dimension. And the dark minion was like, whoa, this guy just realized more of the truth. The lantern behind his eyes just grew brighter. And so he, the dark minion runs to the dark lord and says, Dark lord, what do we do? This guy just realized more about the truth. And the dark lord's like, don't worry about it. And the dark minion's like, what do you mean? And the dark lord's like, don't worry about it. Because this guy, he, he's going to make a belief out of it. That means even when we access a multidimensional truth, it is so beyond language that we have no choice if we are to communicate it to bring it down to language. That's why when I notice... The issue with speaking about metaphysics is that it's disconnection with reality. But how do you connect it to reality? You go see the vagueness in reality. There's so many gaps. That means it's like something that I really, pre- like I was like very impressed in how Sam Harris is, is the speaker, this neurologist, and he's a, he's a great orator. He's like a great speaker, like... You know, like he's on, he, his eyes are open to the spirit of rhetoric. But I'm telling you, <clears throat> this man, <laughs> he said, for example, he's a neurologist, but he doesn't look at his daughter and think like it's a bunch of, look at all these neurons are leading to like the cuteness of his kid. Like, do you see what I mean? Our psychologies are for now animalistically uh, believing they are thoughts. There will come a time right now, it, it, currently it's 2020. Guys, how hilarious would this be? The person looks at his watch, the person says, what time is it? And the person just says, the year. If he look, The person looks at his watch and says, the year. <laughs> I don't know guys, I don't know. It's like how do you how do you tell people, how do you teach how do you share with someone the fascination of the world? You just tell them like it's just so much of it is unknown and our knowledge is the lanterns that we must kinda hold strongly and boldly and just march. That means it's like so much of your life is in your inner realms. If you don't act on it, nothing happens. And you know what? The inner realms are not a promise. So those people who are perfectionists, they they pro, they will pro, most likely uh, get. Um, let me tell you, it, it's like it's the difference between communicating with a robot and communicating with a human being. When you communicate with a robot, like you'll see in movies, guys, it's like people don't feel any f- bad feeling, any bad vibe when a person punches a robot in a film. But when a person hits an animal in a film, we're like, that's a bad character. Like, that's the bad guy in the film. The guy was cruel to animals. But when the when a person punches a robot, we think that's okay. You see, why? Why is it that that intelligence was separate from this? You see? Because there was a game of free will set in motion. The animal could have lived a gentle life. The human being could have lived a gentle life. In that gentleness, a new civilization could have been born. But a civilization that no longer saw the concept of birth, we just realized we are visitors to manifestation. We are guests in the cosmos, and the host is unknown.
And so in some sense, every person, I find there's two books you can read, two types of books you can read, guys. Books that are from the outer realms, which can be pur purchased at your local bookstore. <laughs> and bo a book which is literally you closing your eyes and studying the micro details of every memory and just wondering about why this, why your life occurred in that sequence. You know, I sometimes like, after seeing the Da Vinci Code, it's like you get, I got such an inspiration. I'm like, all right, I'm like the Da Vinci Code. I'm going to like sit down and try to extract all the symbolic relationships I have with my own memory. That means technically me remembering something in this moment of my past is making a memory of that memory. So I'm remembering that same memory twice technically. So you see every, the action of remembrance is generation. So we are never remembering, we are recreating. I feel we're going to go from this linear, like, yo, my, my brain is a file cabinet for my memories. <laughs> we're going to move, we're going to move away from that kind of mindset. And we're going to realize, no, the brain is nature's voice. The mind is where nature is. The mind of man. Your free will, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, there, could I, my DNA, I awoke in my DNA. Our DNA is like an Iron Man suit. The true consciousness is attribute, attributeless. In my science fiction novel, I shared a sort of future ideological setting where my, uh, I've written this science fiction novel called The Messenger of Giants, guys. It's, it's, it's still unpublished, but certain parts of it are, have been set in motion. It's like this kind of, ma this mass, like, anyways, I'll explain it later, but I'm just telling you, it's set in the year 5025, and in the year 5025, I've given myself such freedom in this novel. I was like, all the things I felt that were not discreet to say in these talks, or I felt like, I, it was just literally, I, I brought, I put a bunch of paper in front of me, and I'm like, I'm going to give myself complete freedom. Like the same freedom you, the person gives themselves under a shower, you know, when they sing. <laughs> These, like, you know, like a, I'm telling you, a lot of people who tried out for American Idol, they sang in the shower and they felt like rock stars. In certain schools of thought, the person just had to be patient and the mind would reveal itself. The mind, the mind would reveal itself to the archetype, not the archetype endlessly transforming for goodness, you know. There comes a moment where you are left with the world. You are left with your memories, you are left with a changing universe, and it's like at the end of time, man roars. Do you know, I, I, I feel the concept of death will become a roar, it will become the roar of the last breath. The death of a civilization, but not the death of the memory of that civilization, you know?
this man, guys, named Rupert, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, he has this concept of morphic resonance. And this man is a very interesting fellow. He's, he's actually, I feel deep down, he feels he's like a yogi, or I think his parents were from the Krishna movement or something. Like he has, he, he, like a part of his psychology is very open to yogic ideology. But at the same time, like in today's society, he's coming across a bit as a pseudoscientist, but he's an incredible scientist. Like science is a method. He's understood the method. And he's achieved in the method too. So this is his theory. So his theory is, more, like here's the thing, I'll read it for you. Morphic resonance is a process whereby self-organizing systems inherit a memory from previous similar systems. In its most general formulation, morphic resonance means that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. The hypothesis, the hypothesis of morphic resonance also leads to a radically new interpretation of memory storage in the brain and of biological inheritance. Memory need not be stored in material traces inside brains, which are more like TV receivers than video recorders. Okay, okay. <laughs> Guys, that's the thing. <clears throat> He's pretty much saying that we are the habits of nature, civilizations, rising and falling are like the memory of the planet which is like a, the habit of the planet you know for me guys i feel there is the invisible glance the invisible stare that's the perfect name the invisible stare is the attribute the state of uh, being <clears throat> what does that mean that means that doesn't mean you're attributeless it means when you are aware of the attribute, you can only be aware of it through the attributeless. That means you need to have space before you move in the furniture. So it's another way of saying... <laughs> it's, it's, another way, it's another way of saying you need to have space before you bring in the furniture. So you got to take out the old furniture. So in some sense, you can't be a new human being if you don't look at new stuff. Our bodies need food to survive. Our minds need vision to live on. <laughs> so when life changes you, you, you literally discover how it is happening in you. On some level, guys, I <clears throat> found an algorithm to never getting offended. It was so easy finding an algorithm because I was like, on some level, I'm like, who has my eyes? And I realized nobody has my eyes. I have my eyes. Then I asked myself, even if they had my eyes, even if someone could understand me, I don't even understand me to, for them to understand me. Do you know what I mean? So on some level, this thing of people trying to understand each other is an artificial kind of attempt. But on another level, caring for the evolution of the species is a different matter. For me, it's a strange thing. Some people, they saw ancient books as divine. Some people looked at, for example, I don't know, like they thought like plants were divine. Mr. Within is looking at the vision of an advanced civilization. Nothing is more divine than seeing what the collective activity of 8 billion creatures on a rock looks like. I am telling you, nothing is more fascinating. You know? That means if Rupert Sheldrake was saying it's more progressive, it's fat, more fascinating or an advanced civilization, I would tell you, I would tell Rupert Sheldrake to look in the mirror, you know, and because it, in some sense, it, it, an advanced civilization, guys, is the gravitating idea. Terence McKenna predicted that there's this sort of transcendental object where through novelty, that, that means Terence McKenna, uh, like, here's the thing. <clears throat> let me, let me just explain this. Let me explain this properly, guys. Terence McKenna did the opposite. Uh, did something fascinating can be done in philosophy? I'm going to just share it with you, but I got to double check it here. Just I need to.
So English astronomer Fred Hoyle, Jesus Christ, I don't know this. Fred Hoyle is credited with coining. <laughs> Sorry guys, sometimes it's okay to see paradoxes. English astronomer Fred Hoyle is credited with coining the term Big Bang during a talk for a March 1949 BBC radio broadcast saying these... I, okay, this might not be accurate. <clears throat> Anyways, Fred Hoyle... <clears throat> perhaps it's maybe somebody else, but the English astronomer Fred Hoyle, 1949. And it was a theory. That means some guy suddenly said, bang! <laughs> you know? I think perhaps the idea of the Big Bang happened when some guy like was talking about it, scientifically, philosophically, deep ideas were being discussed. Then suddenly some guy heard a gunshot and the guy was like, Eureka, Big Bang. <laughs> the universe was shot into manifestation. Uh, what an interesting idea. The universe was pushed, was projected. The big push, not the big bang. Push means there was something before the bang. Something was push, pushed it. Guys, check this out. Um, <clears throat> so this is the idea of the Big Bang that Fred Hoyle seems to have spoken about was based on the hypothesis that it, it, it's this, sorry. These theories were based on the hypothesis that all the matter in the universe was created in one Big Bang at a particular time in the remote past. So guys, isn't it interesting that whether you are a scientist or you're a religious person or you're a philosopher, whatever, every person, because we were creatures that were born physically, we were created, we are wondering about its creation. Like literally, bosses and work are all going to the people, their employees, and they're like, what did you create today, employee? You know? Did you just sit on your chair like a statue, or did you create something? <laughs> so I'm telling you, the universe is an unknown place. So we are more certain that we don't know than we know. So we are starting from a position of not knowing. When we don't know something, that's space. That's a good place to navigate. You don't know how many times when I reach a situation that's too complex, I simply have to slow down. Literally, it's a pilot in turbulence. You have to get out of that cloud. I'm going to read this other passage, guys, about the development of the idea of the Big Bang. In the 1920s and 1930s, almost every major cos cosmo cosmo cosmologist preferred an eternal steady state universe. And several complained that the beginning of time implied by the Big Bang imported religious concepts into physics. Oh my god, in the 1920s and 1930s, almost every major cosmologist preferred an eternal steady state universe. So steady state eternal universe, that means this balanced eternal manifestation and the stars and several complained that the beginning of time implied by the Big Bang imported religious concepts into physics so guys the Big Bang technically is maybe strangely echoing a religious archetype so the concept that something began Technically, it's as if scientists are like, whoa, 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 did we just deny God but say the universe was, began 
Do you know what I mean? That means it's like it's like you're saying there's no creator, but then you're saying it create it got it was created from a bang. Do you know what I mean? So so it's like we can't deny language. So the when the language wars end, human beings will begin to appreciate how they always through patience can find a way to look similarly. I literally, guys, after a point, I I'm not a person who I would say I have like uh I have a strange sort of friendship with the world, do you know? That means it's like you care for the world because if you don't, it dies. That's the messed up part. It dies earlier. It's like, yeah, you don't water a plant, it, get, it goes dry. Guys, once I forgot to water this plant, that I cared about, like literally every day I was watering this plant. And then I ran to water the plant and my psychology, this was way, when I was way younger, I had a bonsai tree. But like a way more realer bond, I don't know, like on some level, it was like, it didn't need that much water. <laughs> I'm just saying I apologize to the plant. I was like, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I'm going to get back to this. I'm, sometimes po poetry makes me go on a tangent, but science brings me back down to earth. All right, let's see. <clears throat> so... I'm just going to read this, guys. In the 1920s and 1930s, almost every major cosmologist preferred an eternal steady state universe. And several complained that the beginning of time implied by the Big Bang imported religious concepts into physics. This objection was later repeated by supporters of the steady state theory. This perception was enhanced by the fact that the originator of the Big Bang theory, Lemaitre, was a Roman Catholic priest. Arthur Eddington agreed with Aristotle that the, that the enhanced by the fact that the originator of the Big Bang Theory, Lamont, was a Roman Catholic... Wait, what? What's up? No, sorry, I'm misreading this. This perception was enhanced by the fact that the originator of the Big Bang Theory, Lamont, was a Roman Catholic priest. Arthur Eddington whoever that is, act, agreed with Aristotle. <laughs> All right, so to me, it's like some random person agreed with Aristotle. <laughs> that the universe did not have a beginning in time. Probably Arthur Eddington is a notable scientist, for scientists probably. He probably discovered something. Oh, he's an astronomer, physicist, and mathematician. There we go. He was also a philosopher of science and a popularizer of science. The Eddington limit, the natural limit to the luminosity of... Yeah, yeah, this guy's definitely, yeah. He's one of the knights of science. Okay, so this science, like this very advanced scientist agreed with Aristotle that the universe did not have a beginning in time. That matter is, that matter is eternal. Check this out. The question of the eternity of the world was a concern for both ancient philosophers <coughs> and the medieval theologians and philosophers of the 13th century. The question is whether the world has a beginning in time or whether it has existed from, from, uh, has existed from eternity. Anyways, that, that matter is eternal. A beginning in time was repugnant to him. This is to Arthur Eddington uh, and uh, Aristotle. Uh, a beginning in time was repugnant to him, and this guy felt sick when he thought the universe had a beginning. <laughs> he was getting uh, what some would say uh, ad nauseum ad infinitum. <laughs> the guys would get feeling nauseous from uh, ad nauseum ad infinitum. <laughs> Lamotre, however, disagreed. So Lamotre is disagreeing with Arthur Eddington and Aristotle 
which Lamarch, the founder of the Big Bang Theory, technically was a Roman Catholic priest. This is what Lamarch is saying. If the world has begun with a single quantum, the notions of space and time would altogether fail to have any meaning at the beginning. They would only begin to have a sensible meaning when the original quantum had been divided into a sufficient number of quanta. If this suggestion is correct, the beginning of the world happened a little before the beginning of space and time. Wow. The beginning of the world happened before the beginning of space and time. You know what that means? That means space and time are not the beginning of self. That means this is a scientist literally um, uh, not proving the soul, but proving that it cannot, it can never be disproved. What an incredible! What an I'm on Lamarch, Lamarch's side, guys. Like for the first time. Like if Aristotle was a soccer team and Lamarche was a soccer team, I would wear the Lamarche jersey. <laughs> During the 1930s, other ideas were proposed as non-standard cosmologies to explain, explain Hubble's observations, including the mind model. The oscillatory universe originally suggested by Friedman, but advocated by Albert Einstein and Richard C. Tolman and Fritz Zucchi's Tired my hypothesis. Anyways, guys, so here's the notion. So the world has a beginning. Um, it began from a single energy. And this energy was there before space and time was. So technically, mysticism and science have reached a similar conclusion. And you know what that conclusion is? It's unknown. You know? It's like the, the person gets the highest, all the highest degree possible in the educational system and then they're like, all right, tell us, what did you learn? And the guy's like, it's so unknown. <laughs> it's like, what do you want me to say? There's so much our species doesn't know. When life changes you, life is changing itself in your eyes. Life is a very interactive phenomenon, and the mind is a multidimensional experiencer, and the body seems to occur based on the resonance of a singular dimension. Now, when we look at all knowledge, what do you see? When you look at the history books, what do you see? You look at all the history books, you see the stories reaching the furthest of earliest of times then what you see after you've read all the history books in the world you know you suddenly notice after you've read all the stories that you're just seeing ink on paper and on some level history when you look at it at the past is ex it exists but when you look at it at the future you realize it's like the past is pointing to the future that means you attempting the new and seeing what happens is more of an advanced activity than you just 
in some sense remaining in the in accordance to your past. That means really, even if you wanted to, you will never remember your past like the same way it was. When you realize this, suddenly the person doesn't get bothered by language. Do you know? So anyways, guys, the dawn of the absolute. I'm going to read one last poetic work uh, from Attar. This poet from, I don't know, 900 years ago or something. We seek is in eternity. <sighs> Farida Dinato. The home we seek is in eternity. The truth we seek is like a shoreless sea of which your paradise is but a drop. This ocean can be yours, why should you stop? Beguiled by dreams of evanescent dew, the secrets of the sun are yours, but you content yourself with motes trapped in its beams. Turn to what truly lives, reject what seems. Which matters more, the body or the soul? Be whole, W-H-O-L-E, be whole desire and journey to the whole. That means what matters more, the objective realm or the subjective, the objectivity going towards the void or the subjectivity going towards the infinite. You, it's, Attar is saying, whoever you are, go towards what is your, the complete, what feels you, 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 that, uh, how would I say it? If you have a desire, desire to be aware of the whole system. Desire to, desire greatness, you know. And greatness means the attempt at the new. We are all performers in the eyes of the history to be written. Tara has this other quote, guys. He says, the sea will be the sea, whatever the drops philosophy. That means you are a, an a, a energetic presence, conscious, regardless of what thought, ideology, how the object and subject changes, the ener the, how energy is being conscious. It's so instantaneous, it appears as either another dimension like Rene Descartes' mind-body dualism or it is in some sense, how can I tell you? Your energy being a human being on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Fascinating our lives, isn't it? So guys, Anyways, thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope this episode was helpful. Much blessings and obviously. And when life changes you, pretty much the sages said you could do two things in life. You could either trust it or distrust it. When you distrust something, your energy disengage, your intelligence disengages. When you trust something, your intelligence opens up. Anyways, much blessings and obviously.